Hi, I'm Sandy Helberg. You may remember me from episodes of MASH and New Heart or three Mel Brooks films. But here I am talking to Rabbi Saul Solomon on Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, shalom, damn it. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am so delighted to have a comedy actor with us in the neighborhood. This man has worked with so many people in so many ways. He was an early, almost founding member of the Groundlings in Los Angeles, from whence sprung Lorraine Newman and Pee Wee Herman and Jennifer Cool and Pat Morita and Maya Rudolph. He was also in three, count them, one, two, three, or as I like to say, achat shtayim shalosh, three Mel Brooks movies, including Spaceballs and High Anxiety. Uh, He acted with Tony Danza and Michelle Pfeiffer in The Hollywood Nights. He's done sitcoms. He's written for sitcoms. And he even has a rather interesting family line with a Holocaust on one side and a blockbuster sitcom on another. Will you Please welcome to the neighborhood, Sandy Helberg. Shalom, Sandy. Shalom, was machst du? Eh, not so good. Was machst du, though? Eh, schwitzing. It's hot here. It's 100 degrees. We have fires, but it's nice otherwise. Is your sky all full of smoke because you're out there in L.A. or wherever you are? No, not yet, but it's uh, slowly heading this way. But the heat is uh, unbearable. But that's why we moved to California. Is it a record there? There's somewhere that they're having 116 degrees right now. Yeah, in Palm Springs, it's just uh, it's just too hot, you know. It's, it's un- unless you have a camel and uh, you can pitch a tent somewhere. If they're like a camel, I'd rather be humping. I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. But you know, seriously. Oh. <laughs> So, for, first of all, I wasn't even going to ask about this until towards the very end. Oh. But the, the weird, freaky part is that your voice sounds almost exactly like your son's voice. I, it, I wasn't expecting this, I have to say. You are the father of Simon Helberg. He is uh, a cast member, of course, on The Big Bang Theory, where he plays Howard Wolowitz. I, I almost thought he picked up the phone rather than you. It's weird. Well, if he was living here, I would be surprised too, you know. <laughs> well, at well, this point, he's... to get it from somewhere, and thanks God, he got it from me. I know, but he's well, at least, I guess, 30 years younger than you are, and yet he has the exact same voice. Yeah, he's, uh, and he looks a little bit like... He looks a lot like me, but he's about a foot shorter, so uh, I still have that on him. I told him when he is my height, then he can... He doesn't have to be respectful to me anymore. Oh. But that's not going to happen. I don't, don't think so. Don't, although, you know what? With the money he has now, he could get implants. He could lengthen his legs by a foot and, or, and, and beat you. And on a, a stack of $100 bills and be taller than it's, me. Obviously, you're going to be proud of him. How often do you get to see him? Uh, you know, every once in a while. I mean, he's got two kids and... Uh, You know, they work all the time. We're on this side of town. He's on that side of town. But uh, we see each other. It's uh, it's good to see him. And it's good to see that he's happy and that he's uh, fulfilled his dreams. Look, it's like winning the lottery, honestly. Uh, To get on a show like this for 12 years, very few shows. MASH, I think, was on 11 or 12 years. I did one of those. But uh, one show, 12 years, making that kind of money... Oh, yeah. If you, lo- if you last four years and you're in syndication, already you're making funny money. You're making the kind of money that could buy my shul 20 times over. I keep telling him he needs to buy a synagogue, you know. Uh, he doesn't have to go in public. He can have his own synagogue in the backyard and take the kids. And Well, no, 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 no. He needs, he needs two synagogues because one he has to buy and the other one he has but he doesn't go to. That's right, but he does make donations every year. There you go. That's right. It. That's and he it. could have a live-in rabbi in the guest house. You know, give him my number. Give him my email, my Twitter feed, my MySpace. Give him, give him my wine computer, even. Just you know, go back, eight-track tapes, all of it. <laughs> eight-track tapes, yes. Those were classics. We're kidding around here. By the way, what is your Sandy... So your Jewish name was probably what, Shlomo or Shmuel? Uh, Shmuel, Shmuel, Shmuel Moshe Helberg. 
Shmuel Moshe Helberg. Oh, my God. So you are Jewish. Uh, that's what they say, yeah. You know, I, uh, years ago, uh, my agent got a call from these producers who I knew, and they wanted me to come in and play the part of a priest. My agent told them, are you sure you want him to play the priest? He's got a map of Israel tattooed on his face. <laughs> but I did play the priest. It was some uh, kind of inside joke, and uh, I never would wear a collar like that again. Oh, yeah, but, especially not when you're schwitzing like this. Yeah, you know, see, I was born in Frankfurt, Germany, yeah. and, you know, my parents were Holocaust survivors. So when we came to this country, I was about a year old, and we wound up in Ohio, and they sent someone from the UJA as our sponsor, and the woman was there to, to meet us, and the woman asks my father, she said, what a cute baby, what's his name? And she, my father holds me up in the air like Kunta Kinte, you know, <laughs> and said, this is Shmuel Moshe Helberg. And the woman said, not in this country. And she gave me the name Sandy. I don't know if she had a dog or a bird named Sandy. It is a good name for a comedy person. Sandy Barron, if you remember him. Yeah, yeah, but at a year old, who knew? Oh, the true, true. Now, again, you not only have the Jewish connection, you have with your parents the Holocaust connection. So, so of course we have to talk about the Holocaust. And, and it kind of ticks me off when you got people who say, oh, oh, there were Holocaust survivors. They survived the Holocaust. And really, they got out of France, smuggled out in like 1936. It's not the same as your parents who were right. in concentration camp. They were there for six years. They went in at the beginning of the war. They were, my father was 13 years old, and my mother was the same age, and... Uh, Which, it, what, it was near Auschwitz, but it wasn't Auschwitz? No, they were in Auschwitz. They were in Auschwitz, oh wow. They were in Poland, uh, that's where they grew up. My wife and I went to Auschwitz about two years ago. Being the romantic guy I am, I decided we would go there for our wedding anniversary. But uh, <laughs> oh, God. My, my wife will never forget it. But I said, look, I understand there's a beautiful Weston Auschwitz. <laughs> and uh, people think this is in poor taste, but it does say use showers at your own risk. But, you know, seriously, <laughs> my parents did go through it. And then we, like I said, we moved to Ohio. Wait, 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 no, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop you because that's an hour-long conversation right there. Your parents right. were 13. I would assume... You said they were there for six years. I would assume after a year or two, everybody, they cycle through and die. How the fuck do they live? Well, my father at 13, he was too small to do any heavy labor, but his older brother was a barber, so he was able to cut hair, and they used him. He cut the soldier's hair, and also he was a real schmoozer. He made himself indispensable, and they liked him, and so he would go back and forth from the women's camp to uh, cut the soldier's hair, and he also would shine their boots. And he would take the boots back and forth, and he used to smuggle bread into the boots to the woman, women's side and smuggle it to his two sisters and the woman who would become my mother. They would catch him once in a while, and they'd slap him around, but he knew they weren't going to get they rid of him. They weren't going to shoot him. They weren't... Uh, yeah. And, you know, when I started working and doing, you know, comedy, when we became extremely successful, he always had this thing of being in show business. So he said to me, you know, when I was in the camps, I was the funniest guy there. And I looked at him and I said, now that's a tough crowd. <laughs> he made jokes and he entertained and that's how they kept themselves going. It is unimaginable that they spent six years there, but... Uh, and when we went to Auschwitz, I'll tell you, it just brings you to your knees. You cannot believe it. But anyhow, that's the, the uh, humorous stuff. Well, I do a solo show called oh. You Can Only Blame So Much on the Holocaust. <laughs> and, you know, it's about growing up in Ohio uh, as a refugee, as a Jew. As You know, I went to school when I was uh, seven, eight years old. I talked like Jackie Mason, and they had never heard anything like that, you know. Come on, boys, we play baseball. I hit the ball, you run around the bases, and I catch the ball, and I throw the ball. And so they sent me to speech therapy to get rid of the accent. <laughs> yeah, it's a little close to George Plimpton there, I think. No, I'm kidding. I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> yeah. but my, here's another, I can't let the parents thing go. So, your parents somehow 
survive six years in literal hell. Right. And yet, when they get out, they come to America, you know, your father holds you, oh, this is small, etc. Your mother and your father apparently were active in synagogues and doing things. Right, right. Why did they stay Jewish? What did they believe in? How could they still be practicing believing in God? Well, my father was, I remember as a kid growing up, very religious, and he believed there was a reason that he survived and that my mother survived. Uh, he did tell me that uh, it was just a matter of what were your options, to survive or to die. And a lot of the people in the camps that they knew did die. Uh, my mother was the only one in her family that survived. My father had two sisters who survived. And wow. He told me how he came home from school and went home and went in the house, and it was empty. You know, the doors and windows were open, the drawers were open. His family was gone, and he never saw them again. And he went back into the town, and he got uh, a truck came by and just grabbed him and put him in the truck and took him to Auschwitz. And uh, Right, but, but again, so all of that leads up to the question, when he's in America, when she, when they're married, when they're having you and raising you, right. why were they not atheist? Uh, you know, I, I, he just always had a strong faith in uh, Judaism, and, and as you said, very active in the synagogues. He, in Ohio, in Toledo, Ohio, my father, uh, there's one Jewish cemetery, and uh, he built the a memorial to the Holocaust survivors, and it was in the Jewish cemetery, and he just had a lot of faith in God because God was good to him afterwards. He became very successful in business, and again, this is someone who, at 13, finished their edu formal education, and he davened every day. So you have to have, I think, something to hold on to, to go through that and become an atheist is sort of like... Uh, not believing in the reason you may have been chosen to survive. Oh, that's interesting. We're getting deep here. We're getting deep. I know. I and where are the jokes? Huh? Where are the punchlines? Let's have some comedy. I, I have to tell you, though, when we went to Auschwitz, uh, we drove. We rented a car in Czechoslovakia, and we drove. And I got stopped for speeding. And I got a ticket, and someone said to me, they would never imagine hearing that two Jews were in such a hurry to get to Auschwitz, they got a speeding ticket. And that's what it was. But the thing is that they have across the street from the camp, they have condominiums that have views into the camp. Oh, God. I thought, how do you advertise that? You know, you pay more to view into the camp or you pay less. The uh, condos come right up to the road across the street from Auschwitz. Uh, I guess you pay more if you have an ent a view of the entrance where the train used to come in. But um, I want no. I mean, you're joking, but it's it's all my. Remember when the nuns were camping out in Aus Auschwitz? And like, yes, yes, yes. When we were there, uh, I went into one of the barracks, and there were a group, maybe uh, eight, nine rabbis from all over the world. And I asked, I told them the story. And they said a prayer for my parents in this one, one of the barracks. You know, they could have been in or not, but uh, it just, uh, like I said, I felt I had to go there uh, to see what they went through. Nobody else in my family was too excited, and no one else went. But I went, and it was like I said, it does change you. It does you get a different perspective of life. But my father, to him, every day was a gift. He continued as a barber once the war was over and once he came to this country. He started out working for, of course, in those days, an anti-Semitic guy. And my father bought his barber shop from him and then had three, four barber shops and got into real estate and became very successful. And he had three spoiled sons, although I was the one born in Germany, the other two... Uh... Now, I was going to ask about that. At what point did you, because we're all talking, of, of course, about immigration, when did you become an American citizen? Are you a, are you a German citizen, essentially, dual? No, no, I didn't. I became a, an American citizen when I was a junior in high school. I don't know why we waited that long, and I, I, I think, what is that, 16, 17? At a certain age, if I hadn't become a citizen, I would have to take the test. And if I failed the test, 
it's like what's going on right. today I, yeah. uh, with ICE, you know. They would have sent me back to Germany, and what would I do there? You know, <laughs> I mean, so I uh, became a citizen, and at that time they said you can change your name from Sandy to whatever you want. So I went through all these names, Sean, mm. and Christopher, anything that... Not Christopher, good uh, Too but, Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> but and then I thought, how am I going to leave school one day as Sandy and come back the next day as Lance? So I just kept the name Sandy. But it, it came in handy in prom time. All the guys would get uh, discounts for prom tuxedos. I got a discount for a prom dress. And I look pretty good in that dress, too, I'll tell you. Wait a minute, I'm joking. Oh, because oh, it was uh, like a female name? Is that the reason I didn't get the joke there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. because I, it would come to Miss Sandy Helberg. And... Oh. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you did look kind of cute. And it's funny, we were talking about Sandys and Sandy being an appropriate name for Jews and acting and comedy. Uh, you met another Sandy, I guess, when you were in your 20s, who taught you some acting stuff. Sandy Meisner. Yeah. Yeah, there's another Jew named Sandy. What did you learn from him? You have to really get in touch with your emotions, with your feelings. Uh, you can't pretend. You have to be in the moment. He was a great teacher. I went. Uh, Jeff Goldblum and I were in school together. Ooh, what was he like he, back then? Back then, he was uh, still taller than everyone. Yeah. He he was he was a kid, and he had just come from Pittsburgh. Well, we actually had three Jews in class. I don't know, you know the uh, comedian Jonathan Katz? Vaguely. Is it, he's not Mr. Katz, the psychiatrist, uh, one with one of the herky-jerky animation? Yes, yes. Oh, Mr. Katz, that's him. Yes, okay. Yes, I know who he, he is. Was in, he was in the class, as far as Jews, and Meisner asked us to do something, you know, to think of something uh, personal, and he went around and asked everyone what it was, and he got to Jonathan Katz, and... He said, what is it? He said, he was trying to remember all the dead people he knew. And Meisner looked at him, and there was this pause. And he said, get out. And he said, well, uh, John said, well, he said, no, get out. And he threw him out of school right there, <laughs> right on the spot. And that was it. What the, what the, why? What, what the hell? Well, he felt that was like, he was, uh, it was a joke. It wasn't serious. And you look, you know, we kind of laughed at it, and uh, it was not about being funny, which was good for me, too, because I always focused on that, and thank God that came naturally, so it was the other part that I had to learn, to be serious, to play it serious, not to look for the joke, not to look for the punchline, and so uh, he yeah, was You out. have to be real to be funny. If you start behaving funny, it's not funny anymore. Right, and if you try and make everything a joke, or if you try and look for the laugh, like the show I do, the solo show, uh, I don't rehearse it, I don't uh, have a script, I do it off the top, I mean, I know what I'm going to say, but I, I lived it, and it just gives me so much more freedom by not memorizing, I talk, with, I talk to the audience, and... Uh, Where can people see you... Do. Uh, at the Groundlings. Uh, I've been back there uh, doing the show, you know, every few months. You know, yeah, I was one of the original Groundlings. Now explain. Groundlings, they're not just improv. There were improv sketches, comedy. There were before or after things like Chicago City Limits and Second City, or around the well, same time-ish. The Second City was really the first one. They started in the 50s. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, at that time, they were the Compass Players, but the Groundlings officially started like in 1974. So I had just come to L.A. Uh, I heard about this group. I, at that time, it was just, you know, like seven, eight people in the entire group. And we had a 33-seat theater in a terrible neighborhood. Joining that was just, again, a liberating, opening myself up experience. You know, so I was one of the originals, and I still go back and do shows. We've done a lot of anniversary shows, and... Uh... So I mentioned some of the people who came out of the Groundlings over the years. Some of the earliest ones, including uh, Lorraine Newman was there. Right, well, Lorraine Newman and I, she, she and I did a sketch together where she played, can you imagine, she played a shiksa, <laughs> and she was married to me, uh, Morris Potemkin a real, uh, a Jew from Flushing, Queens. And we were at uh, marriage counseling, and the counselor was played by her sister. And so that was the sketch. At that time,
time, Lauren Michaels and Lily Tomlin came to see the show. It was before Saturday Night Live, and Lily was doing a special, and she had me and Lorraine and a couple of the other groundlings on that special doing those characters. But, but let me ask you this, and, and uh, this goes to also the question about your son before as well. It's like, you know, what do you do when you're a member of the Groundlings or you're an actor, just like a, a hundred other actors that you know, that you've gone to dinner with, that you've done sketches with, and then one or two or five of them... Yeah, I mean, you've had a perfectly good career and a long career, right. but other people, oh, she gets Saturday Night Live. This person gets a sitcom. This person is playing Vegas doing stand-up comedy. And you're still at the level of auditioning and, you know, knocking on doors and getting unemployment on the weeks that you're not working. How do you not be jealous or vengeful? Uh, well, you know, a lot of it uh, is timing. Like I said, my son, uh, I did four or five, six pilots. Uh, some got picked up, some didn't. It is like hitting the lottery. Because originally he turned them down. He didn't want to do the show. And then they came back a year later and asked if he would do the pilot again. And uh, wait, wait, wait. He, Did he ever tell you why he turned down a Yeah, sitcom? I mean, he had reasons, you know, Chuck Lorre, Two and a Half Men. I, I'm, you know, uh, he had just come out of NYU. So, you know, he thought he was going to do, you know, Dostoevsky on TV. I said, no, this yeah. is what... Yeah. going to do TV, this is the guy you want to work for. So he went back the uh, second year and did it, and, you know, the rest is history. I want to talk more, though, about your career. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, my career, again, it's all a matter of timing. You know, a lot of people who I worked with in the Groundlings, uh, Phil Hartman. I mean, well, you've done better than he has in the long run, let's face it. You know. Yeah, yeah, but Phil uh, came to see one of the shows years ago, uh, my son, when Simon was about uh, 12, 13, around there, Phil came over to the house, and I was flattered. He, he told uh, my son, he said, you know, I came to see the Growling Show, and he said, I saw your dad, and he said he was one of the funniest people I ever saw, and he said, that's what I want to do. And he joined the Groundlings, and uh, Phil and I did a lot of sketches together. Also, Lauren Michaels had a stick up his ass about me uh, because he, I don't care if he hears it, I think he's a self-loathing Jew. Who isn't? Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the character I did was very Jewish, Morris Potemkin, and so when we were doing Lily's show, he didn't want me to do the Jewish character. Lily Tomlin loved the character. She said, I want him to do it. So it's like I'm standing there, and they're arguing. And, of course, Lily won out, and I did the character. And after that, Lauren Michaels didn't like me. I thought, well, hey. Well, Mike Michaels, uh, he didn't get Adam Sandler for a long time. He didn't understand, uh, the, right. the, the, even though he hired him. And then, of course, Sandler made the Hanukkah song, and, and suddenly it was okay, I guess, right. to be Jewy on Saturday right. <laughs> Night Live. It, it was also for him an ego thing that he didn't want the character and they uh, he was uh, overridden, overrode. Anyway, they decided uh, they wanted it, so he lost that battle. You know, look, uh, it is what it is. You know, Phil Hartman told me, he used to mention me when every uh, beginning of the uh, new seasons to Lauren, what about Sandy? And he always got the same answer, too Jewish. <laughs> so, you know... He's one guy. Well, he's not one guy. He's an industry. Lauren Michaels is yeah, a Yeah, yeah, he's industry. one guy. He's one industry. He's honestly one show, one job. And so there were plenty of other jobs and shows. And Well, the other industry that you got into, of course, is Mel Brooks. Right. So tell us, how did you meet Mel Brooks, and how did you get into that first movie of his and then others? Well, uh, I have, had a friend uh, who worked with Mel, he suggested me to Mel, Jack Riley. Oh, Jack, uh, is he still alive? He used to be on Newhart. Yeah, no, he passed away oh, sorry, okay. years ago. But I knew Jack, and Jack knew Mel real well, and uh, Jack set it up, and I went to five. You know, I couldn't believe it. It was like a, an out-of-body experience, you know, because as a kid, I remember watching Mel Brooks films, and so I go to his office at 20th Century Fox, and... They tell me to go in. From the door to his office to his desk was like a block, a block long. 
and he sat behind this huge desk, and I kept walking and walking. I thought, I'm just never going to get <laughs> to the desk. I sat down, and he didn't have me audition. We talked for uh, almost an hour, and what it was was I made him laugh. And I'll tell you, I almost cried when he started laughing. And we just kibitzed and talked and schmoozed. And he said, well, the reason why I had you come in was I was going to give you a small part. But I like you. I'm going to give you a bigger small part. <laughs> and so that was uh, high anxiety. Oh, mit Mazel. And then and he used you again and again. Yeah, and I never had to audition. They would call. He has this role in uh, History of the World. Originally, he hired me to play Einstein. We shot a scene. Uh, I had a two-hour makeup with the hair and everything, and we had to sing, and he was going to play Hitler. We were going to ice skate. It was a whole thing, and he uh, decided to cut that scene. It just didn't fit, so he calls me and tells me he's doing the, uh, the uh, Last Supper in uh, History of the World, and he wanted me in that. So I came, and again, you know, every experience with Mel was great, and I worked with John Hurt, who played Jesus, oh. and, and, you know, the people you got to meet, and Mel is so Hamish, and he's so open to suggestions and ideas, and, you know, and the great part was after we finished working, I shared like a trailer with John Hurt, and it was separated by a folding door, and uh, he knocks on the uh, folding door, John Hurt, and said, uh, care for a drink and i opened the curtain and i was like ankle deep in empty bottles of wine and oh. booze and john hurt and i just sat there the rest of the night drinking and laughing and talking and so you know he gave me those kind of opportunities to meet those kind of people and uh and then space balls which uh, was a lot of fun you know again he let us improvise so uh, he what? liked it and i improvised a line yeah where i said after I do the thing and I'm leaving, I said, I'm going to go home and work on my putts. <laughs> and uh, because I had a caddy there with the golf clubs. And so Mel says he likes the line. He says, but it ends the scene, so he has to give it to Rick Moranis. Oh, well. But he says, if you think of something. And so I did. When the screen goes black, it comes back up. I'm like nuzzling, making out with my nurse. That's what I came up with. All right. Hey. <laughs> Smart what man. a job, you know? You know, like I said, it was, uh, and I run into him a lot out here. He's just, like I said, such a Hamish guy, and I met him uh, with his wife when Simon was a little boy. Yeah, he invited us, he invited uh, me to bring Simon to uh, the set, uh, when I wasn't working the day, to the space ball set. Really was interested in showing a kid, uh, like, what's going on, and he showed us around the set. And, you know, he would call me and just ask me to come and hang out, which who could refuse? Oh, of course. But, but again, I'm also wondering, like, he did a couple of movies after those three. Did you ever feel like, hey, Mel, you can't you... Man, look, every actor thinks that. But yeah. uh, he went through that cycle, and in those other movies, he used, uh, except for, like, the regulars. Well, I was a regular. Right. Uh, he used a different cast. Um he didn't use any of the regulars that he used. It was... Uh, In Life Stinks or uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It. Well, those later on, the later films did. Right. But, uh, you know, if there's nothing in it for me, there's nothing in it. I'm objective enough to know if there's not a part in there, you know, unless he's going to sit down and start writing stuff specifically for me. Now, I'm always wondering how actors are able to kind of be, as you say, objective about that and to just release it and not think, oh, he used me for a small part two years ago. Maybe in his next movie, we got along really well, I'll be the star. And it doesn't, it just doesn't <laughs> happen that oh, way. Oh, you Usually, know, yeah. the stars were Mel and Gene Wilder and mm -hmm. Feldman, Dom. You know, but the great thing is when he'd call me and say, why don't you come and we're going to be shooting this scene. And so I'd be sitting there in a circle on uh, History of the World, I'd be sitting in a circle, get this, with Shecky Green, oh. Ron Carey, Dom DeLuise, and we would be kibitzing and laughing. To me, that was a privilege. No, so he didn't hire me all the time as an actor, but he did feel that, you know, he liked 
me to be there. He liked, uh, I guess, my energy, and I could sit around and uh, hold my own, which I usually did, with guys like that, with uh, Dom DeLuise and Shecky Green, because those guys don't stop. They oh, yeah. are just on, and they're hysteric. He invited me to meet Richard Pryor when he was supposed to do uh, History of the World, and he was showing Richard Pryor, and I was there, uh, the sets and showing him around, and then a few days later, before he was supposed to start work, Richard Pryor set himself on fire. Oh, the pit. yes, of course. And so he hired, so Mel hired Gregory Hines. I mean, he literally came in at the last minute. Like, now, see, you could have taken the Richard Pryor part right there. You know, a little bit. That's what I thought, but Mel said, "Come on, don't be crazy." <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so like I said, it's a privilege knowing him. When I run into him, it is, uh, I still get, I mean, I still, I, I, I'm excited to see him and to kibitz with him and schmooze with him. And one of the yeah. people uh, that he used as a regular had died a few years ago and they had a memorial service and I was there and Mel was there and I was sitting near the front and Mel said, uh, well, you know, uh, Ira had done, I think, the most films with me. He said, after Ira comes and he looks down at me, he says, is Sandy Helberg? I said, please. I said, don't put a curse on me. I don't have to be the one that has the most. But there is a website who was in the, in, in the most Mel Brooks movies. I was somewhere in the top 10 or top 15, you know, I don't know. I invited them to come see the Groundlings. He said, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not coming, because if I go to see your show, everyone's going to turn around, look at me, and no one's going to watch you. And he was right. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had celebrities come, and when they came, the audience would just turn around and look at them. You know? Well, you could put them in the front row, then nobody yeah, would turn around. Uh, they would just look at the top of their head. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's no, true. celebrities, uh, they always like to sit in the back. They don't want to distract from the show. So they usually sit in the back in the dark somewhere. We're talking historically and kibitzingly with <laughs> Sandy Helberg, Schmoly Helberg, I'll call you, uh, about all the people that you know, all these things that you've done. So yes, I do want anecdotes because you've appeared in so many movies and TV shows. So I just want to know, you know, little stories about the people that you've worked with. For example, you actually did a... TV show. I can't believe how, how TV was in the 1970s. You, right. They built a show around the guy who played the voice of Carlton, your doorman on Rhoda. Right. Uh, Lorenzo Music. Yeah, you did the Lorenzo and Henrietta Music show. What yeah, the hell was it, that? As a writer and an actor. Yeah. Uh, Lorenzo was also uh, a very prolific writer. He created Rhoda. Oh. He and his partner, Dave Davis, created the Bob Newhart show. Uh, Lorenzo and his wife, they were like a folk singing act in the early days. At that time, they were talking about uh, this doorman character, and Lorenzo said he'll just do it. Again, he came to the Groundlings. He called me the next day. I didn't believe it was real. I thought, Carlton the doorman is calling me? What does he want from me? You know? And he explained he's doing this variety show. Uh, Richard Lewis was a writer on that show. That's where I knew, met Richard from. And Henry Winkler was on the program pre-Happy Days. As a guest, yeah. Oh, so it was, oh, so it was already post-Happy, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I knew Henry right at the beginning of Happy Days because uh, I was working on the Paramount lot at that time as a production assistant, and they were just starting Happy Days, and I don't know, I didn't know him. We ran into each other in the commissary, and we just, again, started schmoozing. He's just come from New York, and we became friends. Cool. You know, and like I said, the rest is, <laughs> it's just a, 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 the business has a lot to do with timing. You know, I knew Henry. Henry was, he was the antithesis of the character he played. He was a refined Jewish boy from a German, a German Jewish family, and he was hardly a thug, and you wouldn't even think of him. Uh, but he had already done Lords of Flatbush, so I think that was. Uh, and every other role that Henry Winkler has done since Happy Days, he's a Nebishi Jew. I mean, he was, he was brilliant on Arrested Development, but what is right. he? He's Nebishi Jewish Henry Winkler. Right. It was so weird That's that the fans. Yeah. Right. Uh, I did the pilot for for Love Boat. And, uh, That's right, you were going to be Gopher. Yes, I played Gopher. There was a two-hour movie of the week, and I played Gopher, and the rest of the cast was also completely different. Uh, Dick Van Patten played the doctor, 
in the pilot. I can and, see that. Uh, yeah. The pilot didn't get picked up. They called me. They said, no, it didn't get picked up. So what happened was then I went to work on the Lorenzo and Henrietta music show as a writer and an actor. They picked up our option, and then they called, and they said, we're going to do a second love boat. Lorenzo, the production com company, MTM, which was the Mary Tyler yeah. Moore production company, wouldn't let me out for two weeks because I had a contract with them. Oh. And they said, if you, if you leave to go do this, you'll be blackballed, which in those days they could do. And I did have a contract with them, and they had the option to either let me go do it or not. And they chose not to. And I never heard a word from Fred Grandy. Isn't that amazing? Uh, ungrateful son of a bitch. Anyway. <laughs> There's that anger. There's that revenge. There's that never for him. I play a character. I used to play a character in The Growlings called Jackie Moldavin. And he was a Jerry Lewis character. And I would bring people up in the audience. And, I, and that's when I became like Don Rickles. I would insult these people. And the audience loved it. You know, and of course. Were, so, yeah, so, you know, the love boat sailed without me, but that's the way the business is, you know. Now, this is this is one of my, maybe my favorite thing that I found about you on Wiki, because we were talking about before how ridiculous it was that they cast you as a priest in something. Right. But there was another show. <laughs> Tell me if this is true, because I find this hilarious. In 1979, there was a show called Flatbush, right. where they cast you as a Puerto Rican de delivery boy from a supermarket, right? Of all, you, of all things, as right, a Puerto Rican Right, kid. My name was Figgy Figueroa. Right. And the other guys were Italians, and they were Italian. But the funny part is not even just the ridiculousness of that, of TV casting. It's that the show was apparently so ethnically offensive that yes. Brooklyn Borough President Howard Golden demanded that CBS pull the plug. Yeah, yeah, we uh, aired, uh, we did seven episodes, and they canceled it after three. They took it off the air. That's pretty shocking, you know, that uh, they only aired three episodes, but uh, yeah, it was still, you know, it was uh, antiquated. It looked like uh, New York in the 40s. Mm. And, and, and it, have you seen those episodes ever since? Have you looked at them 30, 40 years later and go, oh, my God? Yeah, yeah, you know, and the thing was, then I looked uh, exactly like Simon does on his show. My hair Whoa. was exactly the same, and I played the nerd, which is what I always played. Welcome to the club, let me tell you that. <laughs> yeah. now, but, also but you know, I, uh, I, I worked hard not to be that in real life, because I didn't want to get pushed around, and you couldn't get girls. I couldn't get girls anyway, because I've been married my entire life, so... Uh, Mid muzzle? How many years? Forty-three. Mint muzzle, mint click. And they've been three of the happiest years of my life. But you know, seriously, <laughs> no, my wife is from Brooklyn. Of course. Her maiden name, uh, her name was Harriet Birnbaum. Good. And I remember when I met her, I said, oh my God, what a Jewish name. I said to her, You're gonna, you, sh you should change your name. I didn't realize it would be to my name, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been 43 years, and... Uh, well, wait, why would we you change? Two, now we have a two-year-old. No. Yeah, see, people don't know you can still be fertile at this age. Wait a minute, no, no. You, did you, oh, wait, are you joking, or did you adopt, or I want to make a bad joke that will offend you? No, no, it's not a bad joke. She is our son's daughter, and... Uh, oh, oh, because, I, we should mention, that I... I'm treading lightly on this. You, you actually have two. We keep talking, of course, about Simon right. from Big Bang Theory. Yeah, we, we have a 23-year-old, and uh, he uh, and his girlfriend uh, just met, made some bad choices. So uh, we got her. We've had her since she's four months old. So now she's two years old. Uh, she is just the light of our life. You know, she. Although I'm exhausted, I'm schwitzing. My back hurts. My Front hurts, everything hurts. But. Well, you can't, you can't imagine that you must be, what, in your 70s, that you would be raising, uh, essentially, a two-year-old girl. I'm not in my 70s 
yet. Oh, sorry. I'm, uh, pardon me. Excuse me. That's okay. I may look like I'm in my 70s. Don't we all? I'm at the tail end of my 60s. Yeah. We're out with uh, her and people look at us, and I give them the same joke, you know. Well, we didn't know we were still fertile, but... Uh, <laughs> so is your son, how is the, uh, I hate to say the other son, but uh, the, the one who is not on the multi-million dollar TV show, <laughs> right. but he, he's had his problem. Is, is he clean, as it were? Uh, he's working on it, you know. He's working on it now, and... Uh, Have you gone to Chabad? Uh, well, uh, is that the thing in Israel? No, no, they're the folks who did the telethons all day, still do. Oh, Chabad, of course. I know the uh, rabbi out here in Malibu, you know. Uh, well, no, no, it's not about that. They, they do drug treatment and alcohol treatment. That's what they have the telethon for every Rosh Hashanah, is that right. they help get people... Back in the day, they had uh, Carol O'Connor, that great Jew, hosting the telethon. It was, it, and John Voigt. You 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 know you know the telethon. Of course you do. Of course I know the telethon, and Jan Murray would be on. Yes! Let's have a tote! Oh, I love it. <laughs> but, uh, look, you know, we were living in Malibu at the time, and uh, it's not the greatest environment for kids because a lot of the kids hardly ever saw their parents. Uh, they had mm-hmm. step-parents. Again, we've, we were always the only couple still married. Uh, you know, a lot of Simon's parents, uh, his friends' parents, had been remarried and divorced, and so we're old-fashioned. We like to stay together, and why not? We're in love. Uh, who else uh, would I be with other than uh, Demi Lovato? What happened to her? Exactly. Oh, no, she's in rehab now. Anyway, um, but yeah, that's that's how it was. My father, uh, I, to get back to this, after the war, went and looked for my mother, uh, went to Poland, uh, traveled around. He finally found where she was living, and she almost didn't recognize him. You know, in the camps, he weighed 93 pounds, had a shaved head, and he showed up at her door. Now he weighed 98 pounds <laughs> and had a big head of hair, and he had a double-breasted suit that was so big it wrapped around him two, three times. He wanted her to go with him, and she said, I have a boyfriend, he's in the Polish army, he's still on the front lines, which I always wondered, the war was over, what were they doing on the front lines? The Polish cleaning up, I guess. <laughs> and so he convinced her to at least go for a walk, and they went for a walk, and the lights would go on, they would go off, and he said he had to leave. She walked him to the train station, and he got on the train, and she was on the platform, and he took her by the hand, and he looked at her, and said, uh, if you come with me, I'll take care of you for your whole life. She said, but I don't have any luggage. He said, never mind. And he pulled her on the train, and they were married almost 60 years. This is going to be a weird connection thing, but it's a Steven Spielberg connection. Did they uh, ever do the show up project? Did they ever talk and give their experiences, talk about them? Uh, uh, my father spoke to me a lot about it. Uh, he didn't want to do the show up because it would make him emotional, and he didn't like being emotional in public. My aunt, his sister, uh, my wife and I went to Washington, and we went to the Holocaust Museum, and they found things on my parents that I had never seen before, documents. And and then uh, they asked who my aunts and uncles were, and we're standing there, and I hear my Aunt Esther's voice, and I look on the screen, and there she is, and she did one of those interviews. She would talk about my father. He was her, as her little brother. And she said, my little brother, and we did this with my little brother. She survived the camps also. She lost a husband and two children, and the war was almost over, and they were bombing, and they were marching them as fast as they could to the crematoriums, and there was somehow she found a loose floorboard and hid under there wow. for a few days until uh, they were liberated and she came out and she married her which was common then i didn't know she married her brother-in-law the brother of her late husband but i bring up steven spielberg not only because of the show i think but there's a connection there you played him in something when we first moved to malibu i have to say uh spielberg and i look like twin brothers it was interesting living out there because every other person thought I was Spielberg. They would come up to me in the grocery store. They, 
And one time I was coming out of the grocery store and I was getting into my car and this woman came running over and said, Stephen, Stephen. I said, I, I'm not uh, Steve. She said, no, hi, it's me, you know, Jane, remember me? We met a few weeks ago at a party. And the, 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 the. Oh. I said, no, I'm really not, not him. She was so pissed. She said, oh, okay, go ahead and be like that. Go ahead, now you don't know me? And she slammed my car door and walked off. You know, on the beach, a woman came over to me with a bunch of kids. Oh, please, Mr. Spielberg, they want your autograph, and they want your autograph. And the kids were looking at me, and I thought, how can I disappoint them? So I signed it in very small letters from the guy who looks like, and in big letters, Steven Spielberg. Actually, if you had written s sloppy handwriting Simon Helberg, then she probably would have thought it was Steven Spielberg anyway. So you could have right. probably gotten away with so, writing your own name, but yeah. And then I uh, met walking on the beach in Malibu. There was Spielberg sitting on the beach, and I went over to him, and we talked a little bit, and I told him how I get mistaken for him all the time. I said, maybe I'll shave my beard off. And then he looked at me and said, well, maybe I'll shave my beard off. <laughs> I said, fuck you, Steven Spielberg. Don't you dare shave your beard off, you know. I don't need people chasing me, and we laughed, and... <laughs> Shook hands, and that was the last of that. But uh, no, that's very. That, that's actually. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody had ever come to Steven Spielberg and claiming they were you. You know that he was. You. you know what? He he said that. That's what he said. Well, I've had a few. You know, and. Uh, that's not, but but also didn't oh, you? I, I played Spielberg in, in a blockbuster episode. movie. They would always hire me as the director. But in the episode of Sybil, I actually played Spielberg. No, but didn't you also play him in, in some movie that was based on a video game? It was like a... a... Yeah, Mortal Kombat. That's it, never... Mortal... Yeah, yeah. Again, I looked like him, but they never referred to me as Spielberg. Oh. I was just the director, you know, who happened to look just like Spielberg. Now, we have a, just a few more minutes with the, yes. the very funny, the very Hamish, uh, Sandy Helberg. So I've got to squeeze in all these other questions about all these other people that you know. For example, you had a role in The Jazz Singer, not the Al Jolson original, <laughs> but, but the Neil Diamond one. Right. Any Neil Diamond stories or any stories about that crazy film? Uh, you know, it was uh, actually what it was, was uh, you know, the way the business works. The director of the jazz singer i met him he directed a movie called sheila levine is dead and living in new york yeah yeah i, I remember the book i never saw the movie right yeah. it was based on the book and uh i worked on that movie he and i hit it off you know two jews and uh then he was doing i went in to read for another movie he was doing years later and there really wasn't anything in there for me and he didn't have a casting director my wife was a casting director <gasps> so i went home and told i told him i said you know my wife can help you she's a casting director he called her and she worked with him for a couple of days she didn't charge him found the rest of the actors and then when he had the jazz singer he called her he didn't forget and she cast the jazz singer and so they were shooting some of it in New York. So in order for me to get to go to New York on the production budget, he gave me a small part. This way I flew first class. Yeah. Well, they paid for my food, and I, could, I made a few bucks. But uh, Neil was okay. But what was interesting, the connection with Neil was he was scared to death to act, but the one who convinced him was Barbara Streisand. Oh. And she told him to be the boss. I had worked with Barbara Streisand in A Star is Born. Oh, I didn't know that. Nobody knows that. Although some people, again, someone I knew was casting the movie, and it was just me, Barbara Streisand, and Paul Mazursky. Whoa. The scene. The director gave me the directions, where to come in, where to come out. Barbara Streisand kept giving me different direction. And I was caught in the middle, again, like with Lauren Michaels. The, she and the director were not talking. Uh. They argued through me. He would say, I want him to come in from here. She says, no, I want him to come in from there. I want him to leave here. No, I want him to come in there. So they wound up cutting it because there was no uh, continuity. <laughs> right. Sort of appear out of nowhere. Now someone told me that they saw the movie on DVD and my scene is still in there. So, yeah, I got bullied around all day by Barbara Streisand. I didn't mind. She was recording live Evergreen. I called my wife, and we were in this huge theater 
just uh, the two of us and the crew. And it, again, it was a highlight of my life to sit and listen to Barbara Streisand sing for an hour to just the two of us. Yeah. And also, uh, Streisand was mad, but she was mad at the director, not you. You were basically a right, condom. Right, right. So, like yeah. I said, I was the, the schmuck in the middle yeah. who they would push around, you know. Now, speaking of people who are perceived to be schmucks, there, there's a lead-in. How, how was it working on the uh, film, the 1981 movie Modern Problems, which starred Chevy Chase? Success had already gone uh, to his head. Was you know, he a dick or was he okay? It was, you know, I mean, I knew Chevy, again, because of Saturday Night Live, and he had come to see the Groundlings. The whole thing was um, a mishigas. I mean, they hired me. I hadn't uh, auditioned. There wasn't even really a role. They just let me totally improvise, do whatever I wanted to do, and I came up with a character. You know, Chevy uh, is Chevy. I'm not... A... <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, this was like, he made a lot of money on this movie, even though it wasn't a hit, but uh, he was already a, a cocky movie star. But look, you know, every job I just relish and... Uh, uh, I... You're being diplomatic for the first time in an hour here. So, but, but <clears throat> he never treated you badly, or you, did you see him misbehave? No, no, he didn't. Uh, oh. He didn't misbehave. He just, you know, was uh, arrogant. Uh, but again, the director was an old friend of his, and this was the only movie that the director did, and he only got to do it because Chevy signed on as the lead. You know, and there were drugs involved and stuff like that. And uh, But I sat in my dressing room and ate a salami sandwich and kept away from that stuff. Now, you also had a role in one of the greatest comedies of modern times. <laughs> What? Which which do you think I'm talking? Well, no, I, I'm not going to make an up the creek joke. That that's okay. Although though that's apparently better than most people think that it tends to. Both Siskel and Ebert gave that movie a thumbs up. By the way. Yeah, they did, and uh, I think it was uh, Ebert mentioned that uh, you know he thought the cast was good. He thought I was like a Bill Murray type. Yeah. So I was thrilled, that's... look, because everyone else... Look, we knew when we were making it, this was not going to be a, a classic, but I always got uh, wound up in the movies that were ripping off the successful movies. Fair enough, but the movie I was talking about, and a movie that has become a classic, is This is Spinal Tap. Yes, yeah. Come on, that, that is a great comedy. Do you have any stories, any anecdotes of working with Michael McKean and Christopher Guest and Rob Reiner? Well, uh, again, I have to thank the Groundlings. Uh, Rob Reiner and uh, the casting director came to see the Groundlings, and a few days later I get a call, and Rob Reiner wants to meet me, and I come in and I met with him and the, and the guys, Michael McKean, uh, Harry Shearer, Chris Guest. And they just talked, you know, again, in that time, there was no script. So uh, he tells me the part he wants me to play was this guy, I think his character's name was Artie. He, he told me then, he said, we were going to have Paul Schaefer do it, but he's unavailable, and so we're going to have you do it. I thought, that's great. So I show up to work, and Rob pulls me aside, and he said, you know, Paul Schaefer called us. Uh, he's going to do that part after all. And so I wound up with this much smaller part, but I was already there. And again, it was improvised, uh, no script. And uh, but it would have been nice if I had gotten the uh, if I got to do the the bigger role. Part. But you're in a movie that is, you know, historically maybe remembered as the best film you ever did. Arguably, uh, yeah, that I was almost in the best film I was almost in. Well, you know, you were you were just like a small role. You were in it, right? Yeah. I mean, I saw the DVD. Uh, the stuff that I had that they cut was hysterical. But if I ever get my own show, I can use it for that. I have close friends who are in the rock and roll business, and that is their favorite movie, and they watch it over. They're thrilled that I'm in it, and these guys go out and play stadiums with a hundred thousand people, but they're impressed. I did a a couple of days on, uh, on Spinal Tap. Well, I'm impressed too, I have to say. And, and before I let you go, one more movie, a movie that people probably don't remember, but done by a very major director, James L. Brooks, called I'll Do Anything. And the reason I ask is when I look at the cast of this film, every person is either neurotic or eccentric. You had Nick Nolte, <laughs> Albert Brooks, uh, Julie Kavner, Anne Heche, 
What? Right. Was that a chaos festival off uh, when the cameras weren't rolling? Oh, uh, again, it was one of those things. They called me in, and uh, he sat and talked with me. You know, he didn't have me uh, read anything. And uh, there were only two jobs that were like this. He looked at me and said, would you like to be in this movie? Uh, I said, yeah. <laughs> so what people, I don't think, realize is uh, that movie was uh, a musical. It was originally a musical. Prince did the music. Uh, and so there were uh, a dozens of other actors that were not, as my, like myself, that were not seen in the movie because the studio did not like the musical stuff. And so they cut all these singers and dancers out. And I was a theater critic. And, uh, you know, and, and Jim let me improvise my uh, uh, critic, uh, my comments. And then they cut out the whole musical stuff. Uh, like I said, Prince did original songs for it. The rap party for that was unbelievable. Prince got up and did an hour show, and Albert Brooks got up and did material. But then, uh, and then he put me under contract, Jim Brooks, for a while. Ooh. And, you know, uh, nothing came around. But uh, that's how it happens, you know. You get cut, and... Uh, so are, are you, basically we're, we're wrapping up here with Sandy yeah. Helberg, are you, aside from still doing your one-person show, uh -huh. are you retired or do you never really retire? What do you do? What do you do with yourself? No, you don't retire. I mean, it's, look, the thing about being an actor is when they need a guy in the 60s, uh, there are people in their 60s who want to work. But, uh, you know, having a baby here keeps me mm. occupied and I write and... Uh, uh, I love to go to uh, improvisational classes. Just it's, for me, that's a workout, and uh, so you know, I keep myself busy. Uh, well, uh, then I do have to ask you: you, you sit, you write. Are you writing uh, screenplays? Are you writing your sitcom stuff? You're yeah. Just writing... Well, uh, my wife and I, uh, we wrote TV. We wrote uh, from yeah. Golden Girls, and uh, um, uh, what is the show? I forgot um, the one with the Balky and. Uh, Perfect Strangers. Yeah, we wrote Perfect Strangers, and we wrote uh, Dear John. So we were writing at that time a lot of half-hour stuff. And, you know, the business is, is very fickle. As you get older, there's less and less work. Right, you're 100 years old compared to the, the people coming out of Harvard who get hired to do <laughs> Simpsons. No, it's true. It's true. No, right. All the half-hour guys now are Ivy League guys from Harvard and uh, Yale and Princeton. And I mean, who would think that you'd go to Yale or Harvard to be a comedy writer? I, well, I came out of Solomon Schechter Junior High School. Nothing. Nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Not a thing. No one cared. No one listened. No one looked at you. But who's reading the stuff that you and your wife are writing? What's it for? Uh, you know, there are independent producers. We shot a uh, thing called a sizzle reel for an I, a show that we wanted to do and uh, I uh, directed it and my wife and I wrote it and uh, we put up our own money and you know we had a cast and it was about it's about five minutes long it's about all we could afford right but so you know you you send it around the thing is 50 people can look at it you only need one person to say yes of course uh, and then it, it doesn't even have to be for TV, quote unquote, anymore. It could be for right. Netflix. Right. There's so many other outlets. Now. Yeah. So how's that? Was it? out there. There yeah. were three stations. That was it. You know. And so everybody was trying to get the same parts and get on the same shows. Uh, like I said, that's it. There were three networks, and uh, there was one show I did, a pilot. It got picked up. Uh, for a series. It was on NBC, and uh, we were so excited, and they decided to air the pilot uh, on a Saturday night opposite Mary Tyler Moore. And my wife and I are getting in a cab uh, and from our apartment to go to New York, and I'm just thrilled. I was able to get a, a loan on a house based on the article in Variety saying that I was in a series now, you know, and not uh, so. Uh, they knew I was going to have an income, and he said, I'll give you the loan under one condition. I said, what? He said, you get me tickets to see your show. All right. Hey. Week. And so uh, so they aired it opposite Mary Tyler Moore. The ratings were bad. I'm in the cab. I look at Variety. They canceled our show before we even started because the ratings were not good <sighs> for an unknown show, unadvertised, and they, they canceled the show, and we never got any further. 
and I'm yelling, stop the cab, I have to cancel a loan I can't pay for. Nice. But, uh, so, it's, like I said, things like that happen, and... Uh, well, uh, I am rooting for you. I think everybody who has heard you on this interview is rooting for Sandy Helberg to get that sizzle reel sizzling and on fire and work on some other projects, and maybe, maybe it would be nice if we could bring your one-man show out of the West Coast a little bit, maybe bring it I, to, to Colorado or New York or... I would love to. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with Sandy Helberg. It just remains for me to say that again. It has absolutely been lovely. I wish you much more mazel, more health, and uh, you know, great stuff with your quote-unquote child. Your two-year-old, may he grow up to be healthy and happy and successful, just like his papa, just like his uh, uncle, son, or uncle. Oh, yeah, all of that. And shalom to you. Shalom. Uh, have a gitten voch.